Hello, I'm Eric Hanley, an automation specialist with ESNE. In this video segment, we will review GuardLogic safety I.O. setup, diagnostics, and replacement. In addition, we will quickly look over some simple I.O. wiring examples and how that can translate into code. Before we jump into our content, ESNE offers online training through YouTube. Please like and subscribe to the ESNE TV YouTube channel for how to applications and other automation content. Rockwell has expanded its line of safety I.O. cards. The original safety I.O. modules were the Armor Block and Point I.O. But Rockwell has added Control Logics, Compact Logics, and Flex 5000 I.O. modules to make designing and implementing safety systems that much easier. The three new product lines offer extensive capability increases as well as new add-on profiles that add per-channel diagnostic information. Without the necessity for explicit messaging, you can now get diagnostics and tags that will inform you if a specific input has an internal fault or is short-circuited. When adding I.O. modules to the controller project, there are a few additional configuration requirements to ensure the safety network and safety signature are set up correctly. Each module will have its own unique configuration signature that is based on the specific hardware. Also, within the safety tab on the module configuration, you will need to ensure the proper controller has ownership of the module. This allows the controller to verify the safety configuration when adding the safety signature and validating the safety system. Rockwell does have the ability to link third-party modules, but the safety signature will not be automatically created. Instead, you will need to write in the proper signature on the safety configuration tab. You will need to obtain the signature location from the equipment manufacturer, but typically it will be displayed on the hardware label containing the serial number. In addition to the safety configuration tab, there are more tabs necessary when setting up safety input and output cards. For input cards, you will also have input points and test output points. On input points, you will need to configure if the point is safety or safety with pulse test. Safety is used when the device is an OSSD and has its own pulse testing whereas safety with pulse test is typically used for contact devices that then need to be monitored by the PLC. If you select safety with pulse test, you will then need to assign the test source. Test sources are configured on the test outputs and can be set up with pulse test or power supply. Power supply can be utilized to feed power to an OSSD device but you should review the power requirements to ensure that you have enough power for the device without overloading the card. For output cards, you have point type and point mode. Point type can be set up as single or dual. Dual was the traditional way for setup, but single allows more wiring options and has become more popular. Point mode can be set up for safety or safety with pulse test. This matches the same point modes as input cards. Just like the configuration of the I.O. modules are different for safety cards, the replacement of safety I.O. cards also have some additional steps. This is due to the safety signature and safety network number. When replacing the I.O. module, it changes the safety configuration since the new module is physically different. Even though the card is the same part number, series, and firmware revision, the card may require some action. Rockwell has created a simple matrix to show the action required based on the safety signature and the network number. Looking at the first line of the matrix, you can see if the safety signature is applied and the card is brand new out of the box, then you need to set ownership on the IO module configuration page. The table will be overwritten if you configure the controller to always, which requires the reset of ownership, which is on the safety tab inside the controller properties. Now that we have reviewed the configuration requirements for the IO modules, we will be moving into reviewing different wiring configurations 
and how a hardwired system will look when implemented in Studio 5000 code. First, we will review the category level circuits to allow you to better understand what is necessary when wiring and adding I.O. cards. In our example, we will review a simple e-stop push button circuit and the first category will be a CAT2. For a CAT2 circuit, you only need to have a single contact but you must monitor the contact with the utilization of a test output from the safety I.O. card. Next is CAT3, which is the most common design category. CAT3 requires dual or redundant contacts, but does not require monitoring through a test output. The third and highest category is CAT4, which requires dual or redundant contacts, as well as monitoring on both contact sets. Now, moving to a more complicated circuit that has a door switch along with an e-stop that is wired for a performance level E using dual circuits on both devices. Then we are going to enable another relay that can be used to supply power to a motor on the machine. On our safety relay, you will wire out of S11 into the door switch and then one contact on the e-stop and back into S12. Then, you repeat the same for the second redundant circuit. Now, the same system will look different when wiring a safety controller and safety I.O. This time, you will wire from the door switch through the e-stop contacts and directly into input 0 and input 1. One key note is that you can still create a series circuit to save inputs, but you will lose the resolution of which device is causing the issue. Consequently, most systems will wire each device directly back to the controller and add additional DCS instructions to monitor each device individually. The next inputs are the reset buttons, and reset buttons can be HMI buttons or standard inputs, but they will require safety tag mapping. You can also use safety inputs if you have more of those available, but typically people will not use safety to conserve for additional safety devices. Last, you will see that there is a test output being wired to the output relays to monitor the relays for feedback to the safety system. This is a requirement for both performance level D and E systems. However, the feedback signal is not required to be a safety input, so you can drive 24 volt DC through the auxiliary contacts and feed that back to a standard input on the PLC system and map that into the safety task. Lastly, we need to wire the redundant relays to output zero and output one. Since we already have feedback wired, there is no special requirements for the outputs. Now that the system is configured and wired, we can review the code necessary to make this a functional circuit. The first thing that we need to ensure is that there are no faults on either of the safety input channels needed for the circuit. Now that we have verified no faults exist, you can feed a DCS instruction with the safety function of door guard, a input type of equivalent active high, a discrepancy time of 500 milliseconds, and a restart type of automatic. For input type, the alternate option would be complementary, meaning the two signals are opposing. Then channel A would be input 0, and channel B would be input 1 for our dual circuits. The input status will be the code that we created on our first rung, ensuring that no faults exist for the channels. And last, we will add a reset tag from input 3. Again, the reset does not need to be a safety input, but our example used a safety input for simplicity of the wiring. This reset is not a safety reset, but it is a fault reset in the event that the instruction faults out due to the discrepancy time. Also, since our reset type is automatic, this tag has no function, but it is necessary to complete the instruction. After the DCS is set up, we will need to create another rung using a one-shot falling or OSF instruction. This is the safety reset input. Many people use the same reset command for both fault reset and safety reset, but the safety reset is needed along with the OSF instruction to maintain our performance level D requirements.
Original code didn't require the OSF, but it was proven necessary and it's easily overlooked, so ensure that you have that instruction. The OSF in conjunction with the DCS output 1 can be used to enable your outputs. Most of the time, people will add additional logic at this rung to create a more dynamic system. Additional logic can consist of the machine sequence or output faults. After the outputs enable logic is created, we need to ensure that the outputs are not faulted, similar to what we have done for the inputs. With outputs, we also need to monitor the feedback signal, so another rung can be created for feedback status. But if you are using a standard I.O. point, then you can implement that logic outside of the safety routine. Feedback and output statuses are both needed for the configurable redundant output or CRout instruction. Now we will create a CRout instruction with a feedback type of positive, which means the feedback signal will follow the output state. If the type is set to negative, that means the feedback is the opposite of the output state. Next is the feedback reaction time, which dictates how long the instruction will wait after the outputs are energized before the feedback signal is verified. Followed by the actuate tag, which is the logic we created to enable the outputs. Then the feedback signals. You can configure the instruction to utilize two separate feedback signals, but that is not necessary, so you can use the same tag for both fields. That is then followed by the status tags created based on both the feedback status for our input status as well as the output status for the actual output module. The last tag is again our fault reset tag which has been set up as input 3. The last rung needed is to take output 0 and output 1 from the CRL instruction and place them in series to trigger your actual outputs. The outputs are shown in series, but it is not important, whereas the CR out, output 1 and output 2 must be in series to maintain redundancy. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please contact your local ES&E account manager or automation specialist.